Welcome to our Bible study today. We're going to be studying the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, and Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus in order to bring them a knowledge that they were going to be victorious because of the death that Jesus Christ laid before them. But it wasn't just going to be an easy manner. It wasn't going to be an easy task. And Paul wrote this letter probably from jail, either in Rome or uh, Caesarea. You know, they're not for sure exactly where it came from, but he was in bondage. And so he was writing probably at one of the lowest points of his life in the sense that he was, uh, people could wonder, where is Jesus? Where is God in all of this? Uh, I've done the best I can. I've been a servant for you. I have given up much in order to push the gospel forward, and this is what I get. I end up in prison. And yet Paul, it was just the opposite. This was one of the highlights as he sang in prison, as he witnessed to the uh, uh, soldiers, as he listened to those who were in the cell with him. And so to Paul, every opportunity was given to him in order to spread the gospel, no matter where he was. He always looked for that, for the opportunities to spread God's word. And so he is encouraging the new Christians in Ephesus and uh, telling them of the great uh, abundant life and the tools that God has given them in order to uh, shore up their faith with Christ and specifically his strength to be used against the temptations of Satan. So our last five or four lessons have been on temptation. We looked at the temptations of Jesus. We looked at uh, James and his idea of what temptation was all about. We looked at f uh, what causes us to fall into a temptation and how we can respond from that, how we can come back from that, uh, how we can get our lives renewed through Christ. Uh, and so today uh, we're going to focus on the tools, the specific tools that God has given to us in order to help us curtail or defeat Satan as he comes into your life and wants you to change uh, your your uh, good life, the, your Christian life. He wants you to uh, be less motivated to be a close follower with Christ and instead be somebody who just kind of slacks off. Uh, I don't think, like most of us, don't have it within our will to murder somebody. And Satan is far too, uh, far too clever than to try to tempt you into just going out and killing someone. He starts at the very easiest temptations that would bring you to sin. Uh, some of those things, if you look into your own lives, I mean, just ask yourself, what are you, what am I tempted to do? Got gossip, uh, anger, uh, lust, greed, uh, th things like that, things that come into our lives every day that we have a constant fight against. And one thing leads to another. And usually one thing, small thing, leads to a bigger thing. You know, in the uh, world of drugs, a lot of times, you know, they called cigarette smoking a gateway drug because that led m many times to marijuana, which led then to heroin, which led then to opioids. You know, well, of course, that's what heroin is one, but it moves on to cocaine uh, and, and, and on, on up the line. And so it starts off with something easy, something that we don't think is going to harm us. We'll try it. It may not be a big deal, may not be a big issue. And so we take that first drink. Uh, we can handle it. There's no problem. And most of you can, but there's some that can't. And one thing leads to another. And before you know it, the little temptation to do things that you shouldn't really do and you know better than to do um, uh, causes you to backslide into chaos, total chaos and defeat. So looking at Ephesians chapter six, that's where Paul is. And I want to preface that with a, a little story in World War II after Hitler started losing battle after battle, and there was really no uh, no, no hope of him winning, uh, his soldiers may have been destroyed or captured, etc. Uh, and then uh, when the forces came into uh, Germany, got closer and closer, he instituted the, and I wrote it down, the um, Volkssturm, the Volkssturm. And that was an army of children, or men, but basically children, ages 16 all the way through age 60. And there was no time for training. There's no time to get weapons for everybody. Uh, and yet they did the best they could and they gave them what they had. And they were going into battle totally without training, 
totally without the tools that they needed to be victorious. Well, you can imagine what happened. They were slaughtered whenever the uh, Russians and the uh, forces from the West came in, the Americans and um, Europeans, you know, French, etc. And so it was, it was, it was a bloodbath for a lot of them. And these guys had just been forced into a war, a battle that they were not equipped to fight and were not given the equipment to fight it with. And so when we look at Ephesians chapter six, Paul is talking here about God who does not do that to us. He does not leave us without equipment in which to help us to fight the problems and difficulties that are going to come your way. And Jesus is very specific, or Paul is very specific when he talks about who our battles are with. Our battles are with the, the uh, darkness of evil. Now, in other areas, Paul talks about our battles are with our old nature, our old human nature. And I guess that's the uh, door that Satan uses in order to get you to fall from your new nature to your old nature to begin to succumb to temptation, which leads to sin. And so if you uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, um, he starts off by saying, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. So let's uh, stop just for a second for prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for its help in our lives. Thank you, Father, for walking with us and for showing us the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so so uh, all of this preceding Ephesians, Paul was talking about the Christian life, the, the, the uh, uh, problems that's going to come your way, that it's not a walk in paradise, but it is uh, actually a battle from then on. Some people think when you become a Christian, basically everything that you have done in your life is forgiven, which it is, and then all the rest is is uh, easy peasy from there, but that's not the way it is. Things get even tougher. Not that Satan is going to be able to keep you from salvation, but he is going to keep you from the joy of your salvation like he did with David, uh, because David succumbed to sin and he lost the joys of his salvation. Uh, and also to get you to tempt you to sin, to let sin come into your life. Because we are not, just because we're Christians, we're not guaranteed a sinless life. You know, many times that's when the battles really begin. Uh, so he says, finally, uh, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. So Paul is encouraging these people. Ephesus was a city, a Greek city. Of course, it was under in Roman hands by now because Rome overthrew the Greeks. But uh, it had a lot of Greek gods and goddesses in it. It was uh, a, a very popular city. There was a lot of transportation that went through it. It was a major city. Uh, they had a, you know, pl amphitheaters erected there. They had all kinds of statues of gods and goddesses and everything else. Uh, and so this was um, a court where people would be They, they would be um, open or d disclosed to sin of all kinds. Uh, you know, they would see it in the marketplace. They would see it in uh, in their streets where they were, where they're at, in the workplace. Um, they would see it in their neighbors. They would see it everywhere because, in general, you know, Rome believed in pagan gods and goddesses, and they didn't think they really had much control over them or there was much of an afterlife. And so they just live life today as much as they could, as great as they could, get as much uh, accumulated as they could and just have an opulent and great life while they're here. And so the Christians saw this and they thought, well, look how well they're doing. Maybe that's what we need to be doing. Worship their gods or their goddesses so that we, are, we also can have all of this greatness and all this wealth. Uh, so Paul is telling them that that's not the case. You know, that, that, that is not what makes you happy. That's, that's not where God wants you to be. He wants you to fight all of this stuff. And uh, you'll, you'll never win. It's a battle that you'll never win. Uh, Satan is too strong. You can go out there on your own and you can do battle and you'll lose. It's like, um, it, it's worse than when David went up against Goliath. It would be like you going into a uh, boxing match with, uh, I don't know any of the wrestlers or boxers nowadays, but let's say with... Uh, uh, with uh, Muhammad Ali or somebody, Mike Tyson or people like that, you would not have a prayer. I mean, you wouldn't get a punch in. It would be total devastation. Uh, and so Jesus, is, so Paul is saying that that's the kind of battle that you're going to be up against. Uh, but he says, Paul says, but there is hope for you because God has given to you some tools 
that you will need and that will help you to get on the other side unscathed. And so he looks at verse 11. It says, uh, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. The full armor. Now, Paul, he knew about the full armor. He was, uh, you know, tied or handcuffed or chained to a lot of Roman guards who took care of him or soldiers that would take him from place to place. So he knew all about the garb and what they wore and what his function was. And so he's going to break this down in a spiritual sense, showing how we who are soldiers of Christ uh, get that those kind of tools, etc., to fight the devil, to fight the the wiles of the evil forces. So he says, so put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, um, I've talked about this already once, but it would be foolish for us to go into battle, for the Roman soldier to go into battle without armor. It would be foolish that God would give to him all of this armor or that the uh, Roman government would give to him all of this armor to go in and to fight. Uh, and and, uh, and he just wouldn't use it. He said, no, I don't really want to use this. This is all too too much for me. Uh, remember, that's what David did when he went in to fight Goliath. Saul gave him all kinds of armor, et cetera. It was Saul's armor, and it was too big for David. And he said, this is just getting in my way. And he took it off, and he just used a slingshot. Now, that, that was an exception to the rule. Most time, you want as much armor as you can possibly get. Uh, that's why tanks have always been such a big... Uh, uh, you know, a, a valuable force in warfare. It's, uh, you know, may, maybe less today than it used to be, but uh, tanks provided shelter and provided uh, offensive weapons to shoot against the enemy. And they were, uh, you know, an awesome sight. Uh, and so we have here that Paul is telling the people that put on the full armor of God and use it. You know, we're giving you these things to use. And so put them on and use them. Now, I knew a guy who rode a motorcycle, and he was, uh, you know, very cautious usually. He always used his turn signals in his car. He made sure all of his kids used the turn signals. And he was, you know, you know, very um, attuned to the laws of safety. And yet he never wore a helmet when he rode his motorcycle. Now, to me, riding a motorcycle is, is totally, um, I mean, I'm probably talking to somebody who rides a motorcycle, but to me, uh, that, that in itself is a very dangerous act to do, to be on a motorcycle. When I see him pass me on the highway or whatever, I just cringe, thinking if they just hit anything that's not exactly right, they're going to go down and they'll be in the hospital for days and days and maybe not even survive. And so this guy that I knew, he was not wearing a motorcycle. He and his wife were out and he had an accident and he flew off the motorcycle and hit a sign and it killed him. And if he, if he would have had a helmet on, he wouldn't have died. He may have been, I don't know, injured seriously. I just really don't know. But but he died because of head injuries. Um, and so he had the helmets, he had the tools, and he had the knowledge to do what he should have done, and yet he didn't do it. And that's what Paul is telling the people. You've got the tools, you've got the weapons, you've got everything that you need, so, so use them. You know, use God's power to fight off the devil. And so then he gets more specific on what some of these things are. And so uh, verse 12, he says, uh, for our struggles are not against flesh and blood, and and, and they're not, uh, but against the rulers. So let, let me just say that for a minute. Your struggles are not against flesh and blood. You know, you don't have to fight flesh and blood. You don't have to fight your your brothers, your sisters, your, your fellow human beings. You can be, as Jesus taught, a peacemaker. Jesus didn't fight them. I mean, he stood up for what he believed and he stood up for the rights of others, but he didn't fight. You know, he didn't get into uh, fist fights and battles and, and skirmishes and debates and, and anger and all this stuff. Uh, he knew that his battle was not with other human beings, so he didn't even pick a fight with them. You know, when he went to the Roman, uh, well, to, to, to uh, Annas and, and, and to, you know, some of the other high priests, etc., during his times of trial and crucifixion, we went before Pontius Pilate, when he went before Herod, when he went before all these people, he knew that his fight was not with them. So he didn't pick a fight with them. He didn't argue with them. He knew that his fight was with Satan. And when Satan tempted Jesus in the desert, he's using those same temptations to keep him, to trying to get him not to go through with the crucifixion because he knew that would take away his power completely. And you remember when Jesus was in the garden and he said, you know, Father, this is going to be a terrible thing I'm going to go through. I don't know. I don't think I can handle it. I've, I've been 
focusing my whole life on it. But now that the time's here, I just wish there was a way that I could not go through this. Is there any way at all? I'm, I'm praying to you to show me what that way is. But God didn't show him that way. God said, no, this is the only way. And so Jesus accepted it. And uh, and he defeated Satan as nobody ever could. Uh, so verse 12, it says uh, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You know, it, it, it really isn't. If you get into a fight with somebody or uh, somebody who is rude to you or somebody who is angry towards you or somebody who who threatens you, etc., that's not the person doing that. That's the evil within them doing that. And so you're not really against the flesh, the, 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 the worldly person. You're against the evil that's behind it. And you have to look at it that way in order to defeat it. And, and Paul says, this is how you can defeat it. He said, it's, it, it's not against the, the uh, flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers. Uh, it's, it, you know, it, it's against the, the, the rulers and, I'll do, and just authorities also, the rulers and authorities. And some people say that's the emperors and, and the uh, legionnaires and different people like that. But I, I, I look at this to kind of go along with the whole theme of everything. He's talking about the rulers of the universe, the rulers of, of earth. Who rules the earth? Well, uh, overall, we know that God has charge, but he has allowed Satan to have temporary power. And so, and so the, the, the rulers and the rulers who are uh, affected and controlled by, um, by evil, by the devil, by things that have gone, gone in their life. Because when somebody is just evil and and terrible and unfair and treacherous and murderous, uh, it's because their body has been taken over, their spirit has been taken over, their soul has been taken over by true evil. And so you're not really fighting that shell of a person; you're fighting the evil behind it. And so the rulers and the authorities, you know, people who are in, in positions to rule and the positions to have authority. And here we're talking about, I mean, I think we're talking about the evil forces behind these people uh, that that reign terror upon the Jewish people of that time or upon uh, innocent people. Uh, and, and then he says, against the cosmic powers of this darkness. So he's saying against the devil, you know, against uh, all of these powers of this darkness. He's by darkness he's talking about sin. He's talking about the dark days that come about us because of sin that we've let loose, that we let run rampant into the world. And because Satan is in charge uh temporarily and he brings this darkness with him. Now you know you would probably rather drive it during the daylight than at night. Now that may not be true for all of you, but the older you get the more you'll you'll think and know that that's the the, the case. Uh, it, 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 people put uh, search, put uh, spotlights up, you know, uh, on their homes. Uh, they'll they'll put up uh, the cities, you know, they'll put up lights in the city to light up everything because they know that the the more things that are lit up, the less likely there is for crime or anything else. And so darkness is a bad deal. People can do a lot of things in darkness and not be seen, but when things are lighted, when they're lit up, then it takes away a lot of the advantage that they normally would have. And so he's talking about against the cosmic powers of the darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens and evil forces in the heavens. You know, in Genesis, when it talks about the Satan and his angels being cast out because they wanted to overtake God and to be the ruler and the authority, they were cast out. And so we're talking about that evil. We're talking about people, uh, the, the spirits, the angels, the individuals who were cast out of heaven because they uh, had the audacity to stand up against God thinking that they could overcome God and they found out real fast that they couldn't and so they were cast down. And that's what they're talking about here, the, the uh, celestial powers that that infiltrate. Now, I, I, am, a, I am a believer who, uh, I'm, I'm a person who believes that when you say that that the devil caused me to sin, that the devil made me do it, that is uh, not true. Your old nature, that's what makes you do it. Your old nature listens to the devil. Your devil tempts us. But when you actually make that decision to sin, it's not the devil that does it. It's you that do it. And Satan will push on the the uh, the, 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 the cracks and the fissures that you have in your spiritual power, your spiritual strength, in your stamina, and he'll try to get in there and break it apart. Uh, verse 13, it says, for this reason, be because of all this, and it's it's a battle that you cannot win. It's a battle that Jesus 
tells you that you cannot win. It's a battle that Paul says you cannot win. Only through God's help. And God gives you these tools to help you fight through these particular situations. Verse uh, 13 says, So for this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist an evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand. To resist an evil day, I don't think they're talking about a particular day that the devil comes along and, and takes over the earth or takes over all these things. He's talking about each individual moment in your life when you succumb to his temptation, when you sin. Uh, you know, that's the evil day when 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 the, the devil comes to you. So the evil day is every day. As long as Satan is loose, every day could be an evil day for you if you don't have the power of God. It's not like you're even standing ready to go into battle. It's like the enemy's with you all the time. He walks around with you. He hides behind the closet doors. He hides in the attic. He hides in the basement. Uh, he, 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 he walks right behind you. He's always there, right there with you all the time. Tempting, tempting, tempting. It's not like you say, okay, Lord, I know that I'm going to be tempted tomorrow, so I'm going to get ready and I'm going to put on these, these tools, put on the helmet of salvation or all these things, and I'm going to be able to confront you on the battlefield. Uh, no. You don't have time to put all these things on when you think about that, when you think you're going to be tempted. The time to put them on is now. You put all these things on now and you 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 coach yourself and you dress yourself with all of these things. And so it says, for this reason, you will know, take up the armor of God and be prepared in the evil day. And it comes every day. It comes every minute. It's always here. And in verse 14, he says, stand therefore with truth. So now he's going to break down each particular uh clothing, uh, article of clothing, and how it helps you to fight off the evil one in the evil day. It says, stand therefore with truth, with truth. Well, what is the truth? Well, Jesus said he was the truth. And so look at what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? You know, I'm, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. So what did Jesus do to show us the truth? Well, he was compassionate. He was loving. He was caring. He, he did whatever it took to make a difference in the world. He died for you. He died for me. He forgave us. He turned the other cheek. That's the truth that we follow. He was peaceful. He was patient. He was kind. He was humble. He was loving. He was merciful. He was all these things. And so you say to yourself, okay, well, uh, stand there for then with truth. So truth are those things that Jesus taught us by the way he lived. And so we put on this truth, which helps us automatically get a head start on Satan. Can you imagine if you're doing all of these things that Jesus did? Satan, he can't even get a foothold in your life at all. He tried to with Jesus several times and never could. And, and, he, and he says, the truth is like a belt around your waist. Now, the, the belt was used for many things, basically to hold all the armor tight and secure so that when the, uh, the uh, soldier went into battle, all of his armor was useful. Without that, they'd be flopping around and carrying on. And, and some people say the, the, the belt, you know, that when you hear the term gird your loins, they would pull the their uh, skirts up and, and gird them so they wouldn't be hindered by walking and marching and going into war. And so it, it had a lot of uh, uh, purposes, the belt did. Uh, so he says, it writes, uh, he says so, so put, put the truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest. Okay, so they're talking about the breastplate there, which is righteousness. Well, what is righteousness? Well, righteousness is doing the right thing. It's integrity. It's not succumbing to what other people want you to do if you know it's not right. It's not, you know, saying evil things or bad things to other people, hurting feelings, causing problems and difficulty. It's about being honest. It's about being straightforward. It's about being um, uh, willing to take a stand for what you know is right. And uh, it's, you know, it's integrity. And so he says, so stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest. Uh, you can look, I made a note here in Isaiah 59, 17. Isaiah talked about God as our breastplate as he went before us in battle to shield us and to help us during times. Okay, and then verse 15, he says, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. So the, uh, when he says sandals, it didn't mean that they wore sandals. As you, as you know, if you've ever seen a Roman outfit, they uh, had boots. 
and a lot of them were studded a little bit. You remember when you played uh, baseball or football or any kind of sports, a lot of times the shoes that you wore had just little metal spikes in them, little cleats in them, and they could have made that be made out of rubber. Today, they don't do that so much because of the danger of them, but back in the olden days, we all had them like that. Um, and, and it was, uh, and so it says, your feet sandal with readiness for the gospel of peace. Uh, gospel of peace is is the salvation gospel. You know, Jesus died on the cross to give you eternal peace, to give you peace and 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 uh, understanding in your life and how you were walking with with God and how He was helping you and lifting you up through all of these things. And so and so this gives us a peace in the presence of Satan um, when you. Uh, to have to fight somebody or maybe you took a big test or something and you were just scared to death. You were, you were afraid you weren't going to make it. Or if you had to give a uh, speech before your classmates or a lot of people, you may have been just as nervous as can be. Um, I heard once a comedian, he was talking about some facts and he said, the, um, the number one reason that people, the, 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 the number one worry that people have is speaking in front of other people. The second greatest worry is death. And he went on to make to uh, say, so So that means then that people would rather die than have to do the eulogy at a funeral. And I thought that was really humorous because uh, that that is uh, the case. Some people get so rattled that they, they just can't carry on in situations like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just that some people just made up that way. But, but uh, Paul said, you don't have to be that way when fighting the devil, when fighting this strong, powerful force. You don't have to be rattled and afraid and, uh, and, and shaking and not being able to think the right way and be able to take a stand because you, you put on this uh, of peace, the gospel of peace, the sandals are the gospel of peace. It readies you to go into this battle and it brings to you peace, a peace to allows you to think succinctly to think logically, to think spiritually, to be able to get the best out of your foe. I'm not saying that you can ever defeat the devil as far as killing him or anything else, but you can defeat him every day as you overcome temptation. Um, and then verse 16, it says, in every situation, take up the shield of faith which with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So, so when we go into battle, we know who, who is fighting with us, who is fighting for us. We know that it's Jesus, and we know that it's it's God, our, our, uh, the one that we love, our Lord and our Savior. And we know when we go into battle with this kind of faith, it pr provides us a big shield that prevents all these fiery darts that Satan's going to throw at you. Temptation, do this, do that, succumb to this, succumb to that, quit this, quit that, say this, don't say this take a stand, don't take a stand, all these temptations that are coming your way, and you have this uh, this uh, big big shield that, uh, and, and they were different size shields, uh, some of them were the smaller ones that they used actually in battle, and they were made out of wood or metal possibly, and whenever the dart would hit them, it would extinguish even the flames, because a lot of times they would shoot uh, arrows that were flaming arrows at the people, uh, and so you can have this shield that God has given to you that helps you to get through these circumstances. And not only that, some soldiers had shields that were uh, the, the, the whole body length. You've seen um, uh, in police lines and stuff during, uh, you know, you know uh, during, uh, what would I, I can't think of the word I'm saying, revolts or rebellions that go on within uh, cities, et cetera, where people, you know, are, are making making these marches and they get out of hand and they start pushing against the police and they have to hold them back. And a lot of those are those big long shields that keep people from getting through. And so they're they're as they're used in as a wall of protection. So the shields that the uh, Roman soldier used uh, could be used for many different purposes. They were both a defensive shield. Uh, and an offensive shield. They could use them to push on the enemy to knock them down, but basically they were defensive and they would keep these uh, arrows and they keep harmful projectiles that were hurled at you from hitting you. So they were basically defensive. Um, if you were going to fight somebody and he had a sword, uh, it'd be nice if you had a shield to kind of uh, block the throws that the individual was coming at you with. Uh, when a catcher catches behind home plate, he's got, a, or he or she, they've got on all kinds of stuff, a mask, a, a, a chest protector, knee protectors, all kinds of things to protect you from this 
this object that's being hurled at you at 70 miles an hour. Um, and, and so then he goes on to say, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the sword is offensive and defensive. Most Roman swords were short and they were two edged They were shaped. They were sharpened on both sides and they would just do a swinging motion and they were very deadly. And so he says, so take the helmet. Paul says, take the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the spirit. We talked about salvation, which is the word of God. Uh, you know, that's what Jesus always used in order to keep Satan at bay. Whenever Jesus, whenever uh, Satan tempted Jesus, you know, he used the Bible. He used the various scriptures. And we looked at that in, in three of our lessons. We went back to the Old Testament and saw where those scriptures came from and what they meant. And then finally, verse 18, he says, Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. So he ends that by saying, okay, now I've told you about all the tools that you have. I told you about the armament that you have. But let me just say you need to bait all of this in prayer because that is going to be the most important thing that you have in your arsenal to pray not only for yourself, but also to pray for others. And Paul was very uh, specific on that. He said, be at prayer always. Other places in the Bible when Paul talks about, he says, being being in in, in a constant prayer you know being be in a mindset of prayer pray about all things pray for all things see God's hand in all things and if you're in that kind of mindset Satan's not going to be able to get in with you because you're going to find the prayer I mean the power through prayer that God gives to you to thwart all of these things so so you know our lesson today it, it gives you a lot of different ways in which you can fight off temptation and this act this actually is the very last uh, um lesson in on temptation but i think it's been very instructive and very helpful it's been helpful to me and i uh, am thankful that jesus showed us and taught us uh, through example on how to thwart temptation and how living close to god being close to the word understanding what it was saying uh, walking uh, with these tools that paul mentions to us all of these things gives us hope to know that when we fight the goliath of life that it's just simply a shell of a person we're fighting the spirit behind it and God has given us, which is normally is, is a war we can never win, but God has given us a means to be victorious. And so all of these things that Paul was telling the people to give them confidence and to instill into them the, the strength to go forward and not to fight against other people, not to wage war, but instead fight against Satan, fight against the, the person or the spirit that was causing all the problems and all the difficulty. He said, that's where things are, are, go, are going to hurt you. Man can't really hurt you. It's the spirit that can get into your life and cause chaos. So uh, so anyway, ne next week we're going to look at a little, something a little bit different. Uh, it's it's a very uh, interesting. I've already read the, the uh, lessons for next time uh, and looked at some of the scriptures and stuff that I'll be using. And it's it's very good and it helps us in our daily lives not to be critical of other people, not to be critical, and how to take critical remarks that other people give to you or say to you. So it'll, it'll be a good study. Uh, okay, well, let's close in prayer. and Thank you for sharing with me this time. Thank you, Lord, for the tools that you give to us in order to fight the battle that Satan wages against us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us all these weapons and all of these armaments that protect us and help us to lash out against evil. Thank you, Lord, that we have the assurance to know we don't fight any of this battle or any of these wars by ourselves, but that you go with us and you sustain us and you lift us up. In Jesus' name, amen.